brothers and sisters, that we see plainly in the scriptures and that I think we see illustrated in the life of Joseph, as we have it in Proverbs chapter 15. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honour is humility. And if you think of the life of Joseph and the experiences through which he has passed as we've considered together, and you know, you then think of what happened next when he eventually ended up in Egypt and there he, all the things that happened to him. I think you see that principle playing out. And as Peter writes, that we should humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt us in due time as he sees fit for his glory. And our role is simply to obey as we await that glorious day. The events that we find in those chapters then are of, of his exalted position of head of the family. That's where he started off, and yet he was hated by his brothers. He had dreams of greatness, and yet in fact they all seem to be shattered and cast down, and the brothers can't speak peaceably to him. He's honoured by his father to go and seek his brothers, but they only want to kill him. He's put in charge of Potiphar's house, and then falsely accused and thrown into prison. He's put in charge of the prison, and then he's forgotten by the butler and the baker. So although in fact he started off in a way in a position of honour in each case, it's never lasted. In every case he has to wait and to undergo trial <coughs> before at the end he is elevated to that position of honour of which we've just read. Now it's intriguing to ask the question, how long was it that all of those things happened? How, how, what is the span of time? And there are some very useful clues in the record, of course, that, uh, that were given. We're told, for example, quite plainly, that he was 17 when he was taken to Egypt. That chapter 37 told us that. So that's, that's the beginning of the period. Equally, equally, we know that at a certain point, he stood in chapter 41 before Pharaoh when he was 30. So that immediately gives us, you know, some, some idea of the period of time that we're dealing with between his initial removal into Egypt and the point at which he stands before Pharaoh and really the beginning of his elevation takes place. And in between those things we can work backwards, we know he was two years in prison, chapter 41 tells us that, and we know therefore that in the previous point he was with the butler and the baker. So that's as far as we can, know, we can go definitively, I think. And therefore, what happened in between those points is speculation in terms of timing, but we do know what happened. If you think of all those years, we know that for a period he was certainly gaining Potiphar's trust. And you don't take a slave and deposit him and make him over all your house straight away. So I don't know how long it was, brothers and sisters, I'm just guessing. Uh, you've got to have a number of years, really, to go from the point where you're a slave to where Potiphar puts him in charge of his house. So, suppose it was four or five years. And then, of course, you've got another point where he actually acts as the household overseer. This very key role uh, that, that, uh, that he actually had. And then, of course, when he was falsely accused and ended up in jail before the butler and the baker appear. So those three... Those three slots um, could, could vary, couldn't they? They could be different lengths. But it, it's something along those lines, isn't it? It's definitely between the ages of 17 and 28. And you've got to have enough time for those things to happen. So there is Joseph learning. Learning to submit. Learning how to serve. Except he's already learned, really, hasn't he? He's been serving his father faithfully through all those years. And then, of course, once he does get to the point of being in charge of Egypt, if we start the period again as he stands before Pharaoh, he's had two years in prison, as we said before, well then, of course, there is another set of events that takes place that the record is quite plain about, because there had to be seven years of the good years, when, when, when it was fruitful, and there had to be seven bad years to follow it, which don't entirely fit on this slide. You appreciate there's only the first three there of the seven bad years. 
So already, you know, we've got that far into his life, and we know very, because the record again is very explicit, that the point at which he marries and has his children is during the seven good years. So you think of all, all the, you know, the times of loneliness and trials he had, and uh, Potiphar's dreadful wife, and all of those things, they're all in the past now. And from this point on, and we can say then definitively from the age of 30, 30 onwards, things have really changed. And I don't suppose when he was in that pit, age 17, wondering how the dreams were going to be fulfilled, he would never have guessed, would he, what was going to happen. And that by the age of 30, this is the point he would have reached in Pharaoh's court. And now he was married and he has these two sons. Well, we can just end the picture with the fact that, of course, at the second year of those seven, the brothers arrive. Chapter 45 makes that plain. There are yet five more years to, to pass. And God has been working, hasn't he, in the lives of all of these individuals so that they might learn. He's worked with Joseph as we've seen him. That God was with him, it is a repeated idea all the way through those chapters. Whichever house he's in, whether he's in with Potiphar or whether he's in jail or whether he's with Pharaoh, God is with him because he's trusting in God. And equally the brothers have been learning all kinds of lessons. We're not looking tonight at chapter 30. Uh, chapter 38 or 39, but in chapter 38 we have the, the, the accounts of Judah put side by side, his failings put side by side with Joseph's victory over sin in chapter 39. And the two seem quite deliberately put in juxtaposition because Judah's <coughs> events seem to come right in the middle of Joseph's story to, to really contrast them. But of course Judah has learned. He's been through that experience, and I think we should see evidence for how he's learned and the impact it's had on him. He's lost two sons, two dads, by the time this happens. Now, the relationships in chapter 37, we noted before, we saw in the narrative how he referred to his brethren, and how Jacob talks about thy brethren, and Joseph said, my brethren, you remember, and this dreamer, and thy son's coat. And by the time we get to chapter 42, we need to be alert to how the relationships are now going to be described. Because in chapter 42, this is where the brothers first appear. Jacob has seen that there is corn in Egypt and not in the land of Canaan. And therefore he sends them to go and buy corn. And there has been the angelic hand at work and I just wonder whether Joseph has wondered himself whether this day might come. There he is, he must have sat back when, when the elevation happened and he was taken out to prison and set before Pharaoh and he interpreted the dreams and rather like Daniel, able to explain to a Gentile ruler what it was all about. Well, he must perhaps have wondered. Would he at some point see the brothers? After all, if the famine was wider than just Egypt, as it certainly seemed to be, would they come there for food? Would he see them? At any rate, he did see them, didn't he? Chapter 42, verse 6. Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And we can't miss, brothers and sisters, the drama of this. As it says a little further on in verse 8, Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew not him. The transformation in anybody's life from the age of 17 to the age of, what did we get to, 32 or something, the, the transformation in anybody's life is fairly remarkable. And some of us even had hair when we were at, at that age. <laughs> But for Joseph, he's, he's become a completely different character, hasn't he? As far as we, we imagine, he looked like an Egyptian. And they certainly would never have guessed that it would be their brother in charge. That would have been the last thing on their minds. As far as they knew, he was dead. And now here they were in front of him. And if ever he'd wondered, well, here they were. And what did it all signify? 
Well, verse 7 makes the point that when Joseph saw them, he knew them, but he, he made himself strange and spoke roughly to them. Because he did recognise something about it. Verse 9, Joseph remembered the dream. So if ever he had wondered how those dreams would be fulfilled, now the record is telling us explicitly he did make a connection between the dreams and the brothers out in front of him. And now he's thinking, what's it for? What's it all about? And it does seem that the process through which he is taking them is for a reason. And he knows they have to be brought to the point of bowing down before him for a purpose. And it is not vindictiveness, brothers and sisters. He did not see that dream, merely that the Almighty might bring about justification for Joseph and to put down his brothers. That's what, that wasn't the reason why the dream was given in the first place. Any more than it would be the reason Joseph would now want to treat them horribly. But it was necessary that they learned a lesson. And now he's going to bring them through a process to help them to understand the magnitude of what they had done. So just consider it. Verse 16. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. So having established that there was one brother left, one younger brother, uh, verse 13 remarks on that, along with Joseph, who is not, says the end of verse 13. That was their assumption about what had happened to Joseph. Well, he is not. Doesn't even exist anymore. And so he says, you've got to go and get your brother in verse 16. And there's the first mention of this idea of Benjamin, who had to come down. It became a key point, of course, in the discourse that he had with his brothers. And now in verse 17, he put them all together in prison for three days. Now the tables truly have been turned. This one whom they put in the pit when he was helpless. Now they find themselves in ward, in prison, and their freedom taken away from them. And they come down, you know, with that hope of getting food that they might take back to their land. And now they find that they're stuck. And it becomes a vivid demonstration to them of their true state. Here's the first learning they have, that their freedom, in fact, is limited, as in truth it is for all of us. We spoke before about the idea of the pit as a very vivid and powerful symbol of our natural state. There was a brother, in fact, who I think used to live in Western, a brother Lou Sargent, who wrote a very beautiful verse meditation that had in it these lines. <clears throat> How are we free, who brag that we are free, when death stands ward beside the prison door? All men are captives, immured in their mortality, below impenetrable heaven. And in their experience, of being made captive, they are brought to the realisation of something of their true state. And in truth, that is what Joseph wanted to do, to bring them to that realisation of their need, of their need for forgiveness and their need for dependence upon the Almighty, who doesn't feature largely, it has to be said, in the words that we have from them. The Almighty is not often on their lips, as it is with Joseph. <coughs> How can I do this great sin? Against God, he had said. Not against Potiphar, not that he didn't care about the effect on Potiphar, if he'd taken Potiphar's wife, but because ultimately all sin was against the Almighty, and he recognised that. And so it is for us, brothers and sisters, in our state of captivity, to have seen that great light and the one who has come to free us from the pit. So now look at the effect on them in verse 21. They said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, 
and we would not hear. Therefore is this distressed our minds. Isn't that interesting? That there they are in the prison, they don't know they've seen Joseph, and yet now they are forced to think about why this has happened. And they're making some sort of association between their experience and what they did to Joseph, and some kind of larger plan at work. It's happened because we did that, which could be seen, couldn't it, as implying a recognition of a creator at work. And thus, of course, certainly was the case. They had to come to understand the magnitude of what they had done to the Son and to the Father. And now they're just beginning to understand it. I wonder, you know, if they had actually thought and talked about this in the years that had gone by, or whether perhaps more likely they had pushed it from their mind. And as time had gone by, perhaps the mention of Joseph in the household would become less. And they would certainly not want to dwell upon it. And yet now here he is at the forefront of their minds, and they're now saying things that perhaps they only had at the back of their minds. And now, now something really dreadful had happened. Verse 24 of chapter 42. They knew not that Joseph understood them, for he spake unto them by an interpreter. Can you imagine Joseph standing nearby and hearing this? And now here they are recognising and making an association between this that is happening to them. And they haven't forgotten their brother. And no wonder he is moved. And not for the only time in these chapters, is it? The intense drama and the emotion of these events is there in verse 20, 24. He turned himself about from them and wept. Here are the brothers. His brothers, for whom he does care. And he wants to bring them back into fellowship with the Father. That's his ultimate aim. Not, not to vindictively bring about their punishment, but that they might understand what they have done. And so, they are sent home without Simeon, that they might bring back Benjamin. If you come back, you must bring Benjamin. And look on the effect on verse 36, the effect on Jacob. Jacob their father said unto them, May ye have bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and you will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. You can understand him saying it. For all Jacob knew, Joseph was, as it says there, no more, and Simeon's now locked away in Egypt. And you're jolly well not going to take Benjamin. And all these things are against me. Oh, it was understandable, wasn't it, brothers and sisters, that he should say that. It certainly looked that way, that all these things are against me. But it wasn't true. Any more than it's true in our own lives when difficulties and challenges and obstacles arise on the path to the kingdom. And the Lord knows, doesn't he, the steps through which he is bringing us, the circumstances of our lives. For the truth is, as the Apostle recorded it in Romans chapter 8, that if God be for us, who can be against us? In the ultimate, he is going to bring about his purpose. And this is the wonder, of course, of this account that we read together. That at any one point, in the middle of those events, just like for poor Job, it looked like everything had gone wrong and everything was at the end. And yet God was working in those events, just as he is in your life and mine, to bring about his purpose and to bring us by his mercy into his kingdom. So it was not something he was very keen to allow, was Jacob, to allow Benjamin to go back. And Reuben tries it in verse 37 to explain. And Reuben says, look, slay my two sons if I bring him not to thee. Deliver him into my hand and I'll bring him to thee again. And you can see Reuben's really, really trying. But, you know, we, we've got to do this because we won't have any food. So I'll tell you what, I'll kill my two, you know, you can kill my two sons if he doesn't bring him back. And, you know, and it's really still nowhere near where it is to be. Jacob isn't at all interested. In seeing Rubin's son is killed, isn't he? That's really not going to solve anything. It's in a measure of 
the commitment that Rubin wants to make, that he's saying, I want to help, but it's not really going to meet the problem. Verse 38, my son shall not go down with you. That's it. And so, of course, more time passes by before the point comes where the food runs out. And then it really is necessary. And look at, in chapter 43, how Judah now begins to appeal. And the basis of his appeal to Jacob. Verse, nine, verse 5. If thou wilt not send him, Benjamin, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Jacob says, well, why do you act so badly towards me as to tell the man whether you had a brother? I mean, why did you have to bring it up? And then there will be no question of him going. And they said, the man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have you another brother? And we had to tell him. It was one of the other marvels, wasn't it? That Joseph had to know about his father and he had to know about his brother. Whether at some point he knew about his mother isn't revealed. And so now look at verse 8. Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die both we and thou and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. And now, Je now Judah himself personally takes responsibility for his brother's welfare. Now, true it is that in the earlier account that we read of Judah, he at least had recognised, hadn't he? He was the one who had said, he is our brother, he is our blood and our flesh. But Judah has learned a whole lot more even since that time, hasn't he? As we said before, he's lost two of his own sons for the Lord's sleep. And now, he's at the point where he's ready to make that personal commitment and to care for his own brother. You can see already how the effect of these events have begun to, to take place in the lives of these men. Firstly, when they're in prison in Egypt, they say, this has happened because of what we did to Joseph, and it was wrong. And now Judah says, I take my personal responsibility for him. And so, he lets them go. And when they get there in chapter 43, verse 26, then he's still interested in them. When Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to the earth. And he asked them of their welfare. <coughs> Same word again that we have. He's still asking after their peace, their shalom wholeness. Still asking them. And said, is your father well, the old man of whom you spake? Is he yet alive? And Joseph's thinking, they've been away a good long time, and I do hope I've not run out of time. And Joseph, with that natural love for his father, is aching to see him. And it would have been the easiest thing in the world to reveal everything. And to want to bring him down. But he can't yet. Because he hasn't finished the work of transforming their hearts yet. There is more they have to go through. And so he asks. And then he actually sees Benjamin in verse 29. He lifts up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son. And, and the text just underlines the relationship and the natural feeling that he had for his natural brother. Is this your younger brother of whom ye spake unto me? And again, the transformation in Benjamin's life has been uh, huge as well, hasn't it? And Joseph made haste in verse 30, for his bowels did yearn upon his brother. Here again is this lovely man who feels so deeply for his brothers. And yet, still the trial isn't over, and he has to send his brothers back, and all that detail that we have in, this, in the next verses of how he sends back the money with them, and the silver cup, and it would be in Benjamin's sack of all of the brothers. How does it come to that special cup? From Joseph, he's in Benjamin's sack of all of them. Why would that be? And how dreadful it is. And so now they're brought to the point in chapter 44 <coughs> where they have to confront 
the very worst thing that Judah had feared. That this boy for whom he had taken personal responsibility has now been found in some mysterious way they couldn't possibly begin to understand with this, with this cup in the sack. And now, therefore, he is the one whose life has been in trouble. And how is Judah going to respond? Chapter 44. And as we go in at verse 22. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he would leave his father, his father would die. And thou saidst unto my servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall see me no more. And it came to pass, when we came up unto thy servant, my father, we told unto him the words of my Lord. And our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, We can't possibly go without Benjamin. It's out of the question, because the man said, If you don't come with Benjamin, I don't want to see you. And so, verse 27, thy servant, my father, said, You know my wife, bore me two sons, and I've lost one. And verse 29, if you take this also from me, and mischief before him, you shall bring down my grey hairs with sorrow to the grave. So, to this point, Judah has rehearsed for Pharaoh, for, for Joseph, sorry, what happened when they went back. And they told Jacob. And the only reason now that they are here is because Judah himself took responsibility. Verse 30. Now therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life. <coughs> That's beautiful, isn't it? There is... Judah's understanding of Jacob's relationship with Benjamin. And you remember how we started off, how the brothers hated how the father loved Joseph more than them, and how it wasn't fair, and how all they wanted to do was get rid of Joseph. And now the father, not surprisingly, has put all that love upon Benjamin. And yet look at how Judah sees it. His life is bound up in the lad's life. There's a lovely verse in Philippians where the Apostle talks about the way that Timothy has worked with him in the preaching of the Gospel. And he says that as a son with the Father, he has slaved with me in the Gospel. So close was the relationship between them. So effective was their work together in the things of God. Well, that's how it was with Jacob and Benjamin and the brothers when they saw it. And this brother Judah now, well, he's expressing it clearly. He's not dismissing it at all. He's recognising it. And how beautiful that was. There is a, another verse. When Abigail appears to uh, meet David and is trying to encourage him not to go and kill all of Nabal's family. You remember that the foolishness of Nabal. And she has this wonderful speech that she says to David to encourage him not to act rashly in taking vengeance on Nabal. And she talks about how your life is bound up in the bundle of life with God. And she reminds him, yeah, that's where your life is. It's with God, it's bound up. And here's really the picture, isn't it? It's not just the relationship between Jacob and Benjamin, wonderful as that was, but it points to another son and another father whose relationship, together working in the gospel, just like Paul and Timothy, it's that relationship that we care about, brothers and sisters, how the father worked with the son and how the son loved his father to the extent he would give his own life for the salvation of his brethren. So now Judah has recognised this relationship. And he wants to protect. Well, just look at it. Look, look at what he wants to do. It shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the grey hairs of thy servant our father with sorrows of the grave. 
For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bond to my Lord. And here is Judah voluntarily and willingly offering himself to be a servant to Joseph. Now here's, here's the revolution that has happened. Joseph went down, the slave into Egypt, rejected by his brothers. Now here is Judah volunteering himself to be a slave to Joseph that he might save the life of his father because, well, see the end of verse 34. For how shall I go up to my father and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that will come on my father. And now here is personal involvement. It's not just, well, my father's going to die. I don't want to see my father suffer anymore. So you see, the lesson has worked. The brothers have now recognised the impact of their behaviour and that they are guilty. We are verily guilty, they said, and that's why this has happened to us. They now recognised the love that exists between Jacob and Benjamin, and he's validated it here, Judah has. And thirdly, and most significantly, Judah has recognised the effect on the father, and he doesn't want the father to suffer anymore. And that's why the lesson is complete. And that's why now, in chapter 45, Joseph, Joseph could restrain himself no longer. And he sends all the Egyptian servants out because now he has to be reconciled with his brothers. He has brought them to the point of realisation, of repentance, of recognising the sin against the son and the father, that now they might be reconciled to the father and the son. And so there was nobody else there, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And for the third time we read in verse 3, verse 2, he wept, but this time aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And one wonders, doesn't it, whether, how far out they were, but they hear it. And wonder what on earth is going on. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? Is he still alive? And his brethren couldn't answer him. Because the whole world under their feet had just collapsed. And this man who'd been in front of them and who brought them through all this process was Joseph, who they thought was dead. No wonder they didn't understand. Verse 4, I am Joseph your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. And here's, here's the wonderfully reassuring words he has for them, that they were not to be grieved nor angry with themselves. For God did send me before you to preserve life. And there's the assurance that the Almighty was at work. It didn't look that way. It looked the most unlikely thing when Joseph was in that pit. And yet it was because Joseph was in that pit that he could bring them life. Just as the one whom his action foreshadowed brought life because he was in the pit. Wasn't it, brothers and sisters? And so the whole chapter reaches its climax here. They, the brothers have been brought to recognise the effect of their behaviour and to be sorry for it. And now Joseph can bring them back to him and show God was working in all of it. And how he had saved them and would save them. Verse 7. God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. There it is, divine involvement. So that it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And in truth, that is how the Almighty has always been at work with his people. That in all the difficulties and the circumstances of individual lives, he has been at work. He has never worked by manipulating people's minds, but by working through circumstances that we might respond and react, and our lives and our faith might be tested. Remember when the angel in Daniel 
had a very awkward character to deal with, for it said, he said, the Prince of Persia has withstood me. And he was delayed. He didn't go twiddling about with his brain, but he worked through circumstances, as he does with us, brothers and sisters, that we might be responsible for our free will actions, but also that God's purpose might ultimately be brought about. And so it was with these brothers. He brought them through all those circumstances that in the end they might recognise this one who stood in front of them and find grace before him and before the Father. Now think about the changed relationships. Chapter 42. The brothers say, we are guilty concerning our brother. And the previous time they'd seen it, they, they'd said, well, this dreamer, and now he's our brother. Chapter 32, we are 12 brethren. The relationship there being emphasised, all 12. <coughs> Joseph says, does my father yet live? And he's still using this language, isn't he? I am Joseph, your brother. Go to my father and tell him, thy son Joseph yet lives. See how all these relationships are being emphasised as he brings about that care for his family. My brother Benjamin and my father. My father and how he longed to see his father and to be reunited with him. Well, it doesn't take very much imagination, does it, brothers and sisters, as we've already thought, to apply these principles to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and as he will yet bring about. And I'm not going to go through a, a detail that, following that through in any detailed way now, but there it is. That nation that came from these brothers has to understand and it has to go through that same process to understand what they did to the son and what they did to the father. How they hated the relationship between the son and the father. How in the son was to be salvation and forgiveness. And they should look on the wounds in his hands and recognising him just as Joseph's brothers did that this was the one whom they pierced and in whom they will bring and in whom God will bring salvation. Before we finish, there are two principles that come out from our studies and two lessons I want to leave you with. And here's the first principle. That God was with Joseph all the way through. In all of those circumstances, whether he knew it or not, whether everything seemed to be going in the right way or what, from a human perspective, might seem to be the wrong way, God was with him. And of course, there was a reason God was with him. Here's this encouragement read it recently. Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you, while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. There it is. Put him at the centre of your life, says the prophet. And that's what Joseph did. He prospered because he put God in front of him. And that's what we must do, as did the Lord Jesus. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. As Elijah said, before the God of Israel, before whom I stand. Wherever he was and whatever circumstance he was in or we are in. For the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivereth them. It might be that the deliverance only comes ultimately out of the pit. Or it may be through many another difficulty. But the Lord knows and he is with us if we are with him. And the second principle is that in delivering his people, God is there first. Whatever the problem or the challenge there was in Joseph's life, God had already been there. God had already made provision. He would already sorted everything out. You think of it. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. When Joseph got to Egypt, well there was Potiphar. 
And he was just the right man, according to God's purpose, to bring Joseph to the point he needed him to. And when the brethren came down, well, there was Joseph. And the principle holds true for us, my brothers and sisters, does it not? As the Apostle reminds in the Hebrews, for the forerunner is for us entered. Even Jesus, made and high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's already arrived at salvation, in his case for the time being in heaven, waiting till the day when he returns to us. But in terms of our salvation, he's already arrived in that place. And you see the, the sense of that idea of the forerunner, one who runs forward, one who goes in advance, those who are sent before to take observations, acting as scouts. And there is the Lord Jesus who has entered in within the veil to fellowship with his Father and to bring us there too. After all, this was the pattern, wasn't it, from ancient Israel? Behold, I send an angel before thee to bring thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. <clears throat> because God's purpose was not to bring one son to salvation, was it? But many sons. I just skipped over that verse. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it became him. It was fitting for the Almighty, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. It was not only one son who was to be brought out of the darkness of death, but many sons who might give him glory by praising him, by doing that which is his will to be ultimate. God has worked with this one to send him before, to save our lives ultimately by great deliverance and to keep a seed alive in the earth. A people for his name who has been calling out of all ages and all generations to be one with him in his kingdom. So that whether they were Abraham, Isaac and Jacob or Joseph, now asleep in the dust after thousands of years, or whether it be us today, my brothers and sisters, or those whom we have lost, whom we have loved in the truth and lost, we might all together be brought to that glorious day when we shall see those who, who we know, who we once knew, alive again, with the faithful of the age of all ages, with the Father and with the Son and all the sons and daughters gathered together into one with him through the one who was the greater Joseph, the one who was to add, you remember, the very meaning of Joseph's name, to add other children to the Father. And so our two lessons. We must hate evil and we must love the brethren. That, that was Joseph's life. To hate the evil and to love the good, as was true ultimately of the Lord Jesus. And it behoves us in every aspect of our walk to examine ourselves and our thinking and our action and ask whether we are walking along that path in every action of our lives. And to love the brethren. I seek my brethren was what he did. And in every aspect of his life, that's what he was trying to do. And are we, my brothers and sisters, as we look around those with whom we know, perhaps those who are struggling, Perhaps those who have drifted away in whatever circumstance that we might have after the example and the pattern of our good shepherd to bring them back to union with him. For we long, brothers and sisters, for that day when he shall appear and he shall bring Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and David and all the others who we love to be with him forever.